Hello, and welcome to the Pricing for the Planet week. During this week, we will give you a lot of information, content about one critical topic. Sustainability, where to start, and how to improve, and where to go. During this week, you will have a lot of different roundtables, webinars covering this topic. Today, I'm super excited be because during this first uh, roundtable, I'm with two C level. And during this discussion, we will really explore how you can turn green initiative into financial gains. And we will try to answer to this question by saying, is it true or not? So before starting, I just wanted to do a huge shout out to our sponsors. We have four main sponsors. We have Synchron, we have Ducker Carlyle, we have Pricing Hub, and we have BCG. A huge thank you to them. Because of them, this event is fully free for everybody. Just as a recap, every day, you will have those kind of video and you will have a summary by email with a lot of information coming from those kind of discussions. So you can dedicate as low as, you know, like five, 10 minutes reading those recap or really go in depth by watching all of those videos. We'll try to keep everything short so it will be roughly between two and two hours and a half every day. So let's get back to our first topic, day one, how we turn green initiative into financial gains. So today I'm with Christian, CEO Europe of Ducker Carlyle, and I'm with Sean, Chief Product Officer at Synchron. So in this event, we want to be very pragmatic. So we wanted to start really by exploring this idea is it true that we can monetize in a sense sustainability? And is it true that we can turn sustainability into financial gains? At Pricing for the Planet, we've seen a lot of examples of companies really turning green initiative into financial gains. We have, for example, IKEA, who created, you know, like a, a circular business model, reselling um, refurbished uh, furnitures. You have Doc Martens, uh, same thing. They are, they are starting their circular business model. We have Schneider Electric, and then we will do a deep dive during this week with Schneider Electric to really understand how they are turning sustainability into a competitive advantage. We are talking about retail a lot. We are talking about, you know, uh, like Schneider Electric type of companies. But what about the industrial sector, automotive, heavy equipment? Do you have example, Christian, of like, typical company that turns sustainability into a competitive advantage? Uh, well, if you want, I can take a few examples coming from the industry uh, to explain how are impacted those companies at different levels. Huh? It could be by choice, it could be by regulation need, or it can be by push uh, fr coming from the customer expectation. So small impact to end-to-end -end, uh, impact. Um, if you take some some example, how the industry is impacted is uh, you sometimes have to rethink your overall sourcing with uh, you know the your supply inbound outbound. Uh, it could be also on the design of the product or the material you lose uh, you, you use. Like for example, a lot of company have to find new material like leather because more and more it is not sustainable, especially when you see how dirty it is to make the color in the leather. <laughs> I mean, this one is really a, 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 big, a big change. So you have to find new material, but still. Uh, um, address the expectation of the customer who is expecting something a bit different than the normal uh, tissue that you have in your car was used to get leather and want to have the same stuff. Or it can also, uh, like if you take the tie, some tie company, have an impact on the duration of your product lifetime. I take the example of the tie because, uh, as you may know, we have some French tie company, I don't give it any name, which is uh, making a new tie with no hair in it. So you have no hair. What does it mean? So it's been that this tie have a duration longer in uh, uh, the, the lifetime of the uh, of this tie can be used longer. So you will sell as a company less tie. However, the customer can use it more longer. So if you lose in term, if you look in terms of total cost of ownership, you may have an advantage to increase the price value of the tie because the customer will use it more longer. And then you need to also gen the way you will explain that to your to your uh, final customer why it is a bit more expensive to buy it, but you will use it more longer. 
Some which are really more impacted, because you didn't mention the automotive industry, I will say this one is started by force, by regulation. Let's say it like this. Um, force by regulation, what I mean by that is one day we all wake up and we heard like we need to have electric car in the future. It's like this. Uh, we have to forget the thermic. Um, I, I, I will not go further in discussion on this part, but voilà. So they have to invest a lot of money to produce new electric cars. Uh, to develop new 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 type of uh, of engine, a new car, new design, so they need to try to find some saving. For that, they try to find how to uh, change completely the operating model mm -hmm. by pushing more the leasing, but also by having direct sales. What I mean by direct sales is instead of selling my car through a network that I own or I don't own, I sell it directly to the final customer through most of the time online and leasing, which means that you have a change in your operating model because you go from wealth seller to retailer, mm -hmm. but it gives you huge area of opportunity of growth because with the leasing, you can start to do new subscription. Owning all the data of customer, you can start to create new revenue stream. You can make new money out of the data and you can propose new services. Um, Why I think and I'm convinced that sustainability could be considered more as an investment and a profit opportunity rather than a cost center. Uh, and for that, I would be nice. I will using the report that I saw from one of the sponsors of the Pricing Week. Let's be nice, even though it's not us. Um, it's the BCG. Uh, I saw the report on the impact of the decarbonization for the company which are on, engaged in that type of uh, investment. Uh, they found out that 25 of the company increased their revenue by 7%, which is good. Uh, 44% are making saving in energy. Okay, I, I see that. 42% in tax decrease. I don't know, but it could be interesting to ask them. But last one that I like is 70% of price increase. So there is 70% of the company who make price increase. That's really show how pricing strategy can be used in sustainability as a competitive advantage, um, that you have a potential to increase also your pricing. And as you always mention, you know, in most of the articles you do on all the, your video, you always say pricing is a game changer for sustainability because this is driven by the circular business model, mm -hmm. uh, such as the second end uh, market, the subscription based service, um, and it helps uh, the whole uh, consumer to change his behavior. Yeah, absolutely. And I think what I will, you know, remember from what you just said, I think it's, you mentioned that you said sustainability is not a cost, but is an enabler for additional profit. And, and I think that's really a false belief that we are seeing everywhere right now. And I don't know where it's coming from, but so many companies are coming to us like, you know, I want to do sustainability, but I'm worried that, you know, the investment will be so important and the cost will be so important. So, you know, where do I start? So really, mm -hmm. this week is about debunking this false idea and really showing the path, you know, where to start, what to do in the sustainability oh, space. Or what to change, because it's also what being your pricing structure you change. You can go from what we used to have in the industry, cost plus, to value-based. Value-based means you need to have a lot of work to define your product portfolio, which family could be value-based. How you define the value into this uh, type of goods. And also, what is the customer understanding on this value and what is their willingness to <clears throat> pay this value? And it's a good transition because I think a lot of companies are treating the transformation towards sustainability the same way they did with digital transformation. And I think with digital transformation, we didn't see this kind of like impact on the entire business model, on the entire company. And with digital transformation, it was okay to not include, you know, like monetization, pricing people, because the change was important, but it was more about like techno technological change mm -hmm. rather than the entire business model change. And mm -hmm. I think that's, you know, that's one reason we are saying at Pricing for the Planet that pricing is so important because pricing is your enabler to really start this transformation towards sustainability. So the reason I'm saying it's a good transition is because Synchron, I think that's, you know, spot on from uh, what you are doing, right? That is exactly, <clears throat> exactly what we're working on here. So what's interesting for Synchron, I'm the chief product and technology officer. And a lot of what Christian was talking about are, are the tools we're building, the software we build for our customers to be able to take those strategies that Dr. Carlisle brings to them and help them run it day to day. And we are very focused on large uh, original equipment manufacturers where they've got very complicated products that the 
the downtime of them is very painful and very expensive. And we focus on all aspects of the aftermarket. How do we keep the right part at the right place at the right time with the right technician and the right skill to get a first time fix? And that is all about sustainability. We are about extending the useful life of this equipment. And, you know, if you think back 50 years ago, as the consumption economy really took off for general household consumer goods, you started to have manufacturers do planned obsolescence, where a refrigerator used to last 40 years, now you're lucky if it's eight to 10. And that's a problem. That's a real problem for all of the planet and the resources that go into just burning through that. So for Synchron, we're really committed to helping to extend that useful life of these products. Perfect. And I think I know a little bit about, about you. I think you have a significant experience in this kind of space. Would you <clears> mind <throat> sharing a little bit about that? Sure. Well, my, my pricing experience goes back well over 20 years. Uh, I joined Amazon in 1999, and there was a number of areas I was working on. Uh, one of them was inbound, outbound logistics, and I was responsible for setting all ship pricing for customers. And it was a very interesting space. Um, one, Amazon early on always had the luxury of clean data. And it turns out that's a useful thing. And so I was able to look at 10 million transactions by across very, a variety of categories and price points to really understand the elasticity and willingness to pay and found some very strong relationships between if you bought a thousand dollar laptop, you have no problem paying $40 for next day air. Uh, to get it because it's a small percentage of the total. But a $10 book, you're not going to pay $20 for next day air or unlikely to. But there was one very important lesson we learned early on, and Christian was talking about willingness to pay, where for key holidays, this was before Amazon Prime came about. So for key holidays like Mother's Day, Christmas, Valentine's Day, we found a lot of customers were unsure, do I pay for next day or two day? And by the way, this is the year 2000, 2001, where for the United States, it could take seven days for a parcel to go from one side of the coast to the other by ground. Um, and so customers had this anxiety. I, I don't know which one to order. It's just Mother's Day gift better show up so mom knows I didn't forget her. And we ended up looking at the pricing and we created a guaranteed delivery proposition where it was the standard ship price plus $1. We just added $1 on top. And it gave our customers the peace of mind that it's going to show up on time. But most of these parcels with good planning, they went ground shipping. So we actually had a dollar of profit on every one of those. And the very last tail end of shipments where for the fulfillment plan, there was some shock to the plan and the right product wasn't where we thought we had to ship at long zone. Those went airplanes, but it was a very small proportion and it, it was very incredibly profitable still actually sending most of the products ground, which are much, much lower carbon footprint. But more importantly, the customers were happy hmm? because their product showed up on time. You know, it's very interesting what you are mentioning because I think right now, if, you know, like 20, 20 years after, this kind of like gymnastic, this kind of thinking about, you know, how can we prove that it's a sustainable product? How can we create <clears throat> trust? I think that's exactly what the companies has have to do to start this sustain this transformation towards sustainability. That's right. And you know, even um, as Christian was also talking about different business models, this is where for Synchron, we're really interested in helping a lot of our clients. They're interested in evolving beyond the break fix world. So mm -hmm. we're, our, our clients are like Caterpillar or JCB or Ford Motor Company, Nissan, very large companies, thousands of pieces of uh, parts on their products. And when one breaks, uh, it's, it's very frustrating and painful for them. There's a lot of move in the industry of how do you get more post-sale revenue streams? Mm. That can be quite lucrative because in the aftermarket space, for large retailer or large manufacturers who have been leaning into this, the revenue growth is two times greater than for the original equipment finished goods, mm. the aftermarket revenue for so services and parts, and the profitability is 1.7 times higher gross margin. So significant profits, faster growth, because once somebody has that product, they're not very price sensitive if a part breaks on it and they really need to make sure that it's repaired. Mm -hmm. But where it's really getting interesting is that companies are moving towards what is called servitization, 
equipment as a service. And that is an evolution of your pricing model that actually says, instead of just selling you the product, I'm going to sell you equipment as a service. And Rolls Royce airplane engines is one of the great industry examples where 20 years ago, they stopped selling you an airplane engine. They sell you flight hour by power. Now, at this point, their incentive is completely aligned with the end customer of how do I get the most productivity and useful life out of this product? Because if that plane's not flying, Rolls Royce isn't getting paid. So it really does align mm. the right incentives. And one last interesting comparison here about equipment as a service. Look at what has happened with data centers and hardware for servers. It used to be you bought a server and people always had this fixed cost risk of do I buy too many or not enough for my own data center. But the movement to the cloud took what was a fixed cost for businesses and turned it into a variable cost where they can just on demand decide how much compute do they want. And look what happened to consumption. It has skyrocketed. Hmm. And that's, this is a very interesting thing for us at Synchron we're excited about of helping our clients along this path of equipment as a service really changes the consumption pattern on the other side. Super interesting. And that's one reason we actually we were super happy to, to have you both here on this first round table is I think a lot of like industries, a lot of companies will look at heavy equipment, automotive to figure out how they can change their business model and to put aftermarket, after sales as really a, a, a real part of the business where right now <laughs> they just want to sell product. That's kind of like the, you know, like a mm -hmm. mass consumption, you know, approach but I think they would quickly realize that there is a lot of money to unlock by being more sustainable and by being more, you know, leaning towards uh, after sales. Mm -hmm. Quick question. So in the audience, if anyone wants to start to get help around sustainability, how can Synchron help? Well, there's a number of ways that we can help people with not just their sustainability, but also their profitability of it. Um, you know, we are, we're software as a service for parts planning, supply chain, where we will tell you the carbon footprint between different choices. And as we have better planning, we were able to have, and one of our clients reduced their air freight by 30% that they were having to ship to dealers for their spare parts. So we can significantly improve on the carbon footprint there, but also with the pricing, make sure that you've actually got the right understanding of willingness to pay and competitive landscape so that you can adjust your pricing accordingly. Christian, maybe mm -hmm. same question. Mm -hmm. If in the audience, anyone wants to think about sustainability, about the transformation towards sustainability, how can Ducker Carlisle help? Well, I think what is important and where we can help is right at the beginning is first to understand where to start. Mm -hmm. Where do I take the all, where I, I start in my value chain, where is sustainability important and define what is important for me, what is not important for me. And we decide to be more like, I will try to use a, a nice word uh, to qualify yourself, hybrid expert. What I mean by hybrid expert is I will not go to a company to help them to send the pure pricing expert without being rude and arrogant with no one. Huh? Uh, I will try to find somebody who has a good understanding of pricing, but also a huge already experience in sustainability or even in the industry. If we are talking of parts, I will try to find somebody who has a after sales, after sales background, who know what is the parts, understand the pricing structure, understand ability. And for, I, for example, that's why how I'm hiring the team currently in Europe. And uh, we have a, a great colleague that joined us um, last month, <laughs> beginning of October, uh, which is uh, Claude-Henri Pignon, who come from big consulting company. Uh, you can find his profile. Uh, but I like the fact that he's like what I call a hybrid expert. So he's leading our um, pricing uh, department, but they have this kind of uh, hybrid approach where we focus on end-to-end, -end, how mm. to help a client to start from, I want to be more sustainable. And as you say, I want also to gain money, grow, and mm. prove what I'm saying. And for that, we can help by defining what is, what is really the, the, the key performance uh, for this company, what are the solution expertise that they need it, and help at every step of the delivery. Um, and when I say what is important, I think um, if you look at the company, there is three ways to see that. Or you start to look at what is my big environmental impact where I can make a big bang immediately, where I can communicate on, I did something and I'm more green because of this and that. So I look at what is the, the, the big impact. Or I can look in terms of readiness. 
What is my readiness, especially on the EAG data, uh, this report? What is my readiness? How I can easily go and communicate to the market that I did some quick win, that I improved this and this KPI, that it puts that in place? Or there is the way we want to do it uh, at the Kirk Allies. Uh, it's first to go on the other way around, is to understand what is the customer expectation? What is the customer understanding? What need the customer and what he can identify by being sustainable in terms of product or services, uh, and how he will perceive this value. I really like this concept of like hybrid workforce because I think that's always a question. And, and I think we started these roundtables asking this question, can we transform green initiative into financial gains? I think we all agree that yes, for sure. But I think a key piece of that, it's more the how will be your workforce, your talents. <clears throat> And I really like your example of saying we need to shift from a you kind of like a silo specialty, silo expertise to more like a hybrid. And we need to put sustainability everywhere. So instead of just saying we have a sustainability team, we should say, well, we have a pricing and sustainability team. We have a supply chain and it's, it's even more. It can start right at the beginning with a research team. And mm -hmm. if you want me to give you an example how we could approach that, that's the way we will go through this pricing wheel journey by having different experts of the Kirkalas that will be involved. So I will do some kind of teaser. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we will have first uh, my colleague Audrey who will start, which is leading our research practice for Europe. And she will look at what is the importance of aligning customer uh, perception and uh, what are uh, the sustainable product or offer that the client can understand before doing any pricing uh, strategy? Huh? Uh, what is the sustainable uh, um, product? What is the competitive pricing data I can gather in the market, compare, understand, uh, and manipulate? And through some of uh, research method, we can measure the willingness to pay of the customer mm. to be sustainable. That's the first thing. Then we will have Ines, which is our one of the more, I would say, poor pricing expert. But she's, um, we'll say, we explain something really interesting is what is the importance to really own your user journey, your user experience before launching a new, new type of business? I mean, if you want to go on the subscription mode, you want to do as a services, whatever you want to do as a new, new rock stream, you better first to understand how to really ensure that you understand the user journey and the user expectation. What is the implication on the product as a services, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. on your uh, distribution? How is my distribution channel affected? How my products or services, what does it mean in terms of organization, measure the performance in the aftermarket, for example? If instead of selling a machine or a car or a heavy equipment, a truck or whatever you want to sell, uh, if I use that at product services, what does it mean in my organization? For, on the sales force, but also on the after sales. What is the impact on my after sales business? And we will have Ashim, who will go on the end to end, uh, the supply chain view, which means how I connect the dot between my product development, the procurement, the manufacturing, uh, focusing on the sustainability. We will have also Kamlesh, who will work on the remanufacturing, as you explained. This is also an area of, you know, what, uh, what we did call this uh, circular economy. How I'm more sustainable by not replacing the goods directly, but instead more trying to see if I can fix it or I use another part where I give this part a new life for more longer term. This is like what I call the economic circulaire. And we'll have Claude Henry, who will go, what you did mention at the beginning is how I measure the performance of all this. Mm. I mean, being sustainable is good, but how I can ensure that I have a performance, that I am uh, in conformity with the regulation, what is my traceability of my product? And how I track what you, we like to call the marketing claims. Mm. But the marketing claims, not in the sense, as a French, I understand, you know, the claims like the warranty, <coughs> something go wrong. And I can, no, no. What I claim in the market, I mean, what I declare as being green, how I can track it and prove it and measure it. Super clear. Let me go back to this concept of like hybrid workforce. Is it something that you see at Synchron? Are you trying to change a little bit how you are hiring? Well, we definitely are as we think about how do we bring multiple skill sets so that we can actually make sure that we understand what our end clients want and need and how they work towards it. I want to follow back up on one of the points Christian said because it's really interesting on how do you understand what's really happening with your products and how they're sold. Mm. We've got a new product that we are just rolling out now called Contract Price. It's very interesting because so many businesses, they'll have extended service contracts, but 
it is a dark art for how they've been pricing them. And then most of our clients have no idea what the real costs are against them. And then they're just surprised at the end of the year when they've missed their numbers and they don't know why. Mm. And so as we think about this equipment as a service, this is an interim step of just helping our clients understand how to price extended service contracts, mm. forecast, pulling in all the data from their historical assets and products. Uh, how many times do they break? What's the cost per labor in year one, two, three, four, five? What's the cost for parts, transportation, forecasting mm -hmm. uh, inflation? And then what kind of margin would they like to be able to earn on that to help people do a better job with their pricing of this? And, and, and if you do stuff like this, the, the, then the question you should have is, is it something where I gain efficiency so I should reduce my price? Hmm? No. <clears throat> is it something where I have a competitive advantage because I had the company, I had the company to... I would say decrease the waste, say increase the storage capacity, the efficiency, or whatever you would call it. Or I can increase my price because I help you to address your ESG reporting, your environmental footprint, reduce your CO2 emission, and then I can sell it at a higher price. Yeah, and I think that I really like what you just said because I think if we try to kind of wrap up and coming back to the... The, the title of this first round table was really like transforming green initiative into financial gains. So, so I think, we yes, we can do it. I think one way is, I, I really like the example of Rolls-Royce engine. Yeah, mm -hmm. so you need to become a partner. You are not like a supplier mm -hmm. or, you know, a buyer or seller anymore. You are a partner. You need to align your own KPI with your client's KPI. I think that's yes. really important. <clears throat> and I think that's one way to enable this you know, like success toward financial gains with sustainability. I think, Christian, you mentioned about this hybrid workforce. You need to change the way you hire people. You need mm. to change how you your go-to-market, um, you know, will be performed. Do you have any other advice for the audience on, like, how to make this, you know, sustainability push a financial gain? Well, I mean, ultimately, it's understanding your customers and your proposition and how that fits in with what they care about. So my last business, GFK, very large data and analytics business for consumer electronics and grocery, we did a lot of research for our clients there, and we found that there was a customer say, do, gap. Yeah. People would say one thing, I will never buy anything that's not made from recycled plastics. And then we look at laptop sales, and at the moment of truth, that's not true. Uh, that's not really what they're doing. So Christian, I'm interested if you had any observations on this, getting through to that, what say do gap for customers, what do they really care about? Well, first I want to, to answer to your question, the way I will appro approach it and what would be my advice from company, I will say that you have to keep in mind that even if you want to change your uh, operating model, uh, your, to your tools, uh, your pricing, whatever you call it, there's people. So you need to consider that as also as a change management program and ensure that you inject the sustainability mindset in the whole organization. If we go back to our example, it's not because I changed my pricing uh, structure, that I change my goal and I do the services, that I don't need to invoice my, involve my sales force because I have to train them to sell my good completely differently with a new argument. And that's where, no, I can answer to your question, is that's why I really need to do this type of understanding of the market and the customer expectation to ensure that I'm able to address the right product at the right client at the right time. Because we all have examples in mind of people who start great things, which is not ready for the market, and there's, yeah. you don't find your customer. Yes. And then you fail. <clears throat> so that will be my advice. It's really on the take the time before doing any pricing strategy, any type of uh, changing uh, something in, in the company is first understand your customer, what they want, what they expect, and how they want to, to, to perceive that. Perfect. Gentlemen, thank you so much. Thank you. Let's continue the, thank the you. journey. Yeah, so just as you continue this journey with the pricing for the Planet Week for the day one, so it was the first round table, what you will have, it you will have a webinar with Nikolai, who is a partner at um, Simon Kutcher, who just published a new book called The Demand Revolution. So he's sharing a lot of insights, a lot of learnings from the publication of this new book. Then we will have a discussion um, with Tensi Wellen. She's the director of the Sustainability Center for NYU. And she's talking about ROSI, Return on Sustainable Investment which is just this concept of like that we are calculating ROI the wrong way, especially around sustainability, because we just look at, 
you know, profit and money. The way she's looking at it, she's like using, I think it's, it's more than nine different areas where you can look at the impact of sustainability. Could be on your supply chain, mm -hmm. could be on regulation, could be on hiring. So you are creating much more value than just like, we will sell more or we will sell with a higher margin. So very interesting discussion. I strongly suggest that you are watching this uh, this discussion. And then we have this Q&A with Mathilde from Danone. She's leading the sustainable finance department at Danone. And she's really talking about, you know, how Danone is really, you know, leaning toward this transformation towards sustainability and all the challenges related to that. Again, that will be the end of day one. A huge thank you for your time and your interest around sustainability. Thank you. Thank you.